uh, welcome back. So today we'll continue where I left off last time, which was with this uh, I thirsty theorem. So to show that if um, n of if two plus of m of your m either circle or interval, uh, then uh, n is abelian. So um, what I'll do is I'll, I'd like to indicate why this theorem is true uh, in view of, of Capel's lemma, which I, uh, inter I also gave last time, but didn't prove and I probably are not given proof of it. Uh, and so Capel's lemma says that if you have uh, f and g in in diff two of, of i with uh, f and g commuting, then uh, f fixed point free and g not not fixed point free. Implies G is the identity of fixed point free in the interior of the interval. Great. So uh, let's look at the proof of the theorem. So we'll break it up into two cases uh, one where M is the interval, and then do the treat the circle separately. So the circle has some. Uh, ideas that go into it, which are, uh, <clears throat> which connect to some non-trivial analysis. So I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then it, it ultimately reduces to the case of the interval. So assume uh, M is equal to I, and we'll be given, so let, let N act on, on I without a global fixed point. So what I mean by that is that there's no point in the interior of the interval that every element of n fixes. Okay? That's just simply an irreducibility assumption. If, if there were such a point that I could just break the interval into two pieces uh, and, and have a smaller action of n. Okay? So, um, So now uh, <clears throat> N uh, cannot act, act freely on I, which is to say uh, some, some non-trivial element uh, has a fixed point in the interior zero one. So, why is this? Well, so secretly, this is Holder's theorem, uh, which Adam introduced us to already. Okay, so right, if you have a, a a group acting on say, the real line by homeomorphisms acting freely, then the induced order that you get is automatically Archimedean, and so there is already a, uh, an injection of that group into the group of, of reals. Okay, so you, you're automatically immutable. So, um, so this is provided, provided N is not abelian. This is from Holder's theorem. So what can we do with this now? Okay, so uh, now, we should use the nil potent somehow. So we're, we've already used the non-abelianness of M to get a, an element F, which is non-trivial and has a fixed point. And because N is abelian, uh, sorry, N is nil potent. So there exists a non-trivial element G in the center of N. Okay. So now let, so let X be in the boundary of of uh, fix f 
it intersects with zero one. So this is a, a point on the on the boundary of the fixed point. So it's it's, it's fixed by by little f, right? but on one side at least of this point, uh, f acts by something that is not the identity. Okay. So the fundamental thing that we need to use now is that in fact g g of x has to be equal to x uh, by Capel's law. So this is not not obvious, though uh, I can sort of explain why. So indeed, um, right, so we can imagine a picture of what this might look like. So here's here's the point X, okay? and suppose uh, suppose G of X is not equal to X. Okay, so then you can iterate G on this point X to the left. You get, um, you know, this is the maybe the, the limit as n goes to infinity of g to the minus n x is over here, and similarly here's the, the positive, uh, the a, a forward iterates of, of g. They give you this non-degenerate interval on which g acts with no fixed points in the interior. Yeah. But now. Uh, G le le leaves this thing invariant, and also F leaves it invariant. That's simply because this point is fixed by F, and F commutes with G. And so this point is also fixed by F. So this interval is also F invariant. Okay. And so now, you, what, what do we have? We have G and F commute because G was in the center and G acts on the, that non-degenerate interval there with no fixed points and F has a to be the identity that that's immediate from, from Capel's lemma now. Okay. But we assumed that X was in the boundary of the fixed points set of F. And so it cannot, so we've just proved that this point is in the interior of the fixed point set of, of F. And so that's a contradiction. So that's why we can conclude that G of X is equal to X. Okay. Great. So now what? So now what we have concluded by, by this calculation is that, so if uh, the N action on, on I uh, is not free, then each element of C of N has a non trivial fixed point. Or it has, it has a fixed point. I say non trivial, it has a fixed point. Okay. For instance, that element G. Okay. So now, if we take Y in the boundary of the fixed point set of G inside of the interior and H and N not equal to the identity, then the same argument that we just carried out with Capel's lemma shows that H, H of Y is equal to Y. But we assumed at the very beginning that N acts with no global fixed points. That proves the theorem in the case where M is the interval. Uh, now let's maybe move on to the case where M is equal to the circle. So that has some ideas, some of which I'll have to sort of sketch because they give all the details that might uh, take me a bit over time. So where are you using the theorem if you if you then refer to Yeah, I use yeah, I use Capel's lemma twice. Yeah, and I really think. Yeah, that is absolutely necessary, right? So I uh, mentioned this theorem at the very end of the lecture yesterday, uh, which uh, I, I'm not going to be able to, to prove in, in the time, uh, is that every no potent group, if, if it has like, if it's if its growth function is like n to the d, it actually, you can, you can make it act by 
diff one plus one over D well, up, up to diff one plus one over D. Yeah, so you definitely can make it differentiable, but not C2. We can even, uh, one, I'll just make as a remark, one can even uh, weaken C2 to C1 plus bounded variation. So that means that you have, um, the, the first derivative is simply a, has to be a, a function of bounded variation. That's already enough. But it's implied by being C2, but it's, it's, uh, it's weaker. So what do we do uh, in the case of, of the circle? Well, <clears throat> the first thing that we need to do is we need to look back at the rotation number okay, and how it relates to uh, invariant measures on, on the circle. So the first thing to observe is that uh, N fixes a, a Borel probability measure on S1. So why is this? I mean, so this is, uh, <clears throat> if you've thought about uh, measured group theory, you, you've probably heard of uh, amenability of groups. And so then this is, so because nilpotent groups are elementarily amenable, in fact, elementary amenable, uh, any action on a compact uh, topolo house of topological space automatically uh, gives you a invariant prob Borel probability measure, but maybe without appealing to something so abstract, we can sort of uh, think about what, what why this might be the case in some sort of soft general way. So if you look at so if you look at um, say the the Borel measures on S1, okay, then you have this like unit sphere of S of, of M, which is which consists of a priori signed probability measures, but there's the positive ones, which are in fact the Borel probability measures, which sit inside of here. These are the uh, Borel probability measures, and these are the uh, this is the unit sphere inside of the space of all. I don't know why I wrote M there. So that should be an S one. So the space of all measures forms. On a topological vector space, and uh, <clears throat> this unit sphere. I mean, it's actually a normed topological vector space. Uh, I'm, although I'm going to equip it with the, the weak star topology, so if you recall, well, that is from uh, functional analysis. Uh, that's you know a, um, uh, a topology that comes from integration against continuous functions on, on the circle. And then you have this, the unit spheres. These are, uh, if you integrated a constant function, those would those just give you, give you the value of, of that function. And the Borel probability measures are the ones which are positive uh, Borel measures with, with total mass equal to one. And if N is acting on on S1, then it preserves all of these structures successively. And the important fact is that this sphere and also BP of S1, these are uh, these are compact subsets in the weak star topology that follows from this very general theorem called the banach alaoglu theorem. And so, so the Borel probability measures on S1. Uh, is a, a compact compact space in the uh, weak star topology. And so what that means is if I have an infinite set of Borel probability measures on S1, they automatically have to accumulate somewhere. So now if I have some group acting, so if you it's, if you if n is too complicated, you can sort of imagine that Z is acting. So you might start with your favorite Borel probability measure, like a, a mass at a point, and you might start just 
pushing that measure forward by by group action and then trying to average it. And so you might try uh, so take m m zero in BP s one arbitrary uh, and and average uh, push forwards over finite subsets of, of n, which are getting sort of larger and larger. So you imagine you look at a very large ball in the Cayley graph of n, and then you average the push forward of mu over that, that finite subset, and you get some new Borel probability measure. Okay, and so now as you do this, as the, as the balls go out to infinity, you get some infinite sequence of Borel probability measures, and, and you hope in general, but amenability exactly tells you that they converge to something, and that measure is going to be invariant. And so you extract the limit, it's invariant. So what I basically told you is the, the proof of something called the Kakutani Markov exploit theorem. Great. So an arbitrary nilpotent group on acting on the circle always fixes a Borel probability measure. Okay. And now, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, uh, the second thing is that the rotation number from N to S1 is a homomorphism of groups. So why is that? Well, so it turns out this to invariant measures. So it's a completely general fact. So let gamma be a subgroup of homeo plus of S1 fixing a measure mu, uh, then we define O mu of F to be uh, mu of the interval X uh, F of X mod Z. We're here at this in L and gamma. So <clears throat> here, uh, the first thing to know that this is actually independent of the choice of X is a, a pretty easy exercise. Okay. And what's more is that rho mu of F coincides with the rotation number of F and rho mu is a, a homomorphism. So this is again, a pretty easy exercise using the invariants. And so, well, why might this be true? Why, why might this uh, invariant measure give you something which is just the rotation number? Well, <clears throat> the thing that you can do is you can uh, so lift mu to a, a periodic, uh, periodically defined, uh, defined measure on R. Uh, really, this is like um, pulling back by some like measurable inverse of the uh, of the exponential map from to the interval onto the circle, and then extending periodically in R. So I'm also going to call that 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 measure measure mu. Okay. And so then uh, you can check that that, that mu of, of the interval. X and uh, comma X plus K is equal to K uh, for all X and R and, and K in, uh, uh, in, in N. So then you can compute something like like this. If if um, if uh, F is a lift of little f to r, and so little f being a homeomorphism of, of the circle. So, <clears throat> and uh, let's say f of x lies in the interval x plus k, uh, x plus k plus one. 
right? then you can enter, you can estimate that um, <clears throat> f to the n x minus x minus one is less than or equal to k. That's less than or equal to the measure of this interval x f to the n of x, which is then less than or equal to k plus one was less than or equal to f n x minus x plus one. So then if you compute limits, you get the limit as m goes to infinity of f the n of x minus x over n has to coincide with uh, the limit as n goes to infinity of mu of x f to the n of x this interval uh, divided by n. And this is the rotation number uh, if you reduce this mod z. Uh, and this, using the invariance again, is just equal to mu of x. And so that's why the rotation number uh, is a homomorphism of groups in the case of uh, when, when you have an invariant probability measure. So what about, why, why do we care about all of this? So these are two facts that we need. One further fact about rotation numbers that I won't justify, but I'll just state, which may be believable at this point. The third is that, um, so if F is in, in homeo, plus of S1, then the rotation number of F is in Q if and only if F has a periodic point and it's equal to, to zero if and only if it has a fixed point. So given these three facts about such groups acting on the circle, right? So we can we consider now the rotation number from n to s one, which is, uh, <clears throat> oh, which is a homomorphism. Okay. And so suppose there exists a, a new in n with uh, irrational rotation number. So then, in fact. Nu is conjugate uh, to an, an irrational rotation uh, by, by Dendroit's theorem, which I mentioned yesterday as sort of the inspiration for the, the entire discussion of, of algebra versus regularity. Okay, so now this means that um, nu, so Nu, uh, so nu is just gives you this irrational rotation. Okay, and so uh, one more fact that I'll sort of sweep, sweep under the rug is that uh, <clears throat> the Lebesgue measure on S one is the unique uh, irrational rotation invariant measure on on S one. So this can be proved from Fourier theory. I'm not gonna give you a proof of this right now, but it's, it seems like a pretty reasonable thing to believe. And so by part one here, and fixing overall probability measure on S1, that means that this entire group N acts by Lebesgue measure preserving homeomorphisms of the circle which implies in fact that N is conjugate to a group of rotations. And so it has to be abelian. So that sort of, uh, if, so this means that if we have a C2 action of a nilpotent group on the circle, then we're highly restricted in terms of what rotation numbers can occur. So we conclude that, that the rotation number only takes on uh, rational, rational values. 
So <clears throat> here's another exercise. If mu is an invariant measure for n under this assumption that, that the rotation number only takes on rational values, then then uh, mu is supported on uh, the intersection of, of periodic orbits of elements of n. So now <clears throat> so let, let x0 be uh, a fixed point, uh, sorry, uh, in the support of the measure. So this is just a point then, which has to be given positive measure by mu is it sits in the intersection of periodic orbits. That means that you know, the measure mu has to be atomic. And let, let H in the center of N uh, be written as uh, H is the commutator of some two other elements in, in N, which is always possible if N is a non-abelian no-potent group. So then X zero is periodic uh, for F and G. And also we mm -hmm. H to the M times N for arbitrary exponents M and N is just F to the M, G to the M. So by taking N sufficiently large, we have that F and G to the N is not abelian no potent and it fixes x zero. But now I have a non abelian no potent action on the circle, which fixes a point. So I can just cut the circle open at that point and get an action of this group on the interval. And that completes the proof of the final version of the Okay. So <clears throat> that's almost, that's basically everything that I'll say about no potent groups and regularity. One thing that I will mention here is, uh, so I said that in the case that you have, then uh, <clears throat> the rotation number is actually a homomorphism uh, to the circle. This is, it's very important to remember this is not true in general. So even in the very, very nice groups, of homeomorphisms of the circle, like analytical ones. So it's been observed already that PSL2R is a subgroup of, of homeo plus uh, S1. And so acting here by projective linear transformations. And you can explicitly find a group here where the rotation number is uh, not uh, uh, for, for which the rotation number received the subgroup of PSL two R is not a homomorphism. So, for instance, you can take uh, the subgroup generated by saying you know two one 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 uh, <clears throat> two zero zero one half, and then something like well, pi zero zero one over. So if you imagine that uh, if you've seen some hyperbolic geometry, then PSL2R acts on hyperbolic space by isometries. And both 2, 0, 0, 1 half and pi, 0, 0, 1 over pi inside of hyperbolic space. And the upper half plane model is just the geodesic going from 0 to infinity. Okay. <clears throat> and 2, 1, 1, 1 stabilizes some other geodesic that shares no fixed points uh, with the endpoints of the geodesic stabilized by these two. And now because two and pi are not rationally related, thus the, uh, these two elements generate a dense subgroup of the stabilizer of that, of that geodesic. And so this group actually then is, is dense side of, of PSL2R because it is Zariski dense and it is not discrete and PSL2R is simple. That's, that's the basic reason. And so 
if you, uh, so let's call this thing gamma. So now gamma being dense means that it meets all the open subsets of PSL through R. Now, if you take the absolute value of the trace, uh, <clears throat> the, the trace from, from the PSL to R to uh, zero infinity, okay? That means that if you look at trace inverse of the interval zero to uh, intersect gamma is non-empty. But anything in here has a non-zero rotation number because anything in here is conjugate to a rotation. But if I look at the rotation number of, of these three elements, you know, they all fix points inside of the circle. And so their rotation numbers are all zero. So manifestly then the rotation number cannot be a homomorphism. That's a maybe useful thing to have to keep in mind. Okay, maybe that's enough about that. Let's move on to some other groups that I mentioned yesterday that I, that I wanted to talk about to illustrate some of the ideas in this theory. And those are uh, right angled arc groups. So <clears throat> uh, historically, the, the, the progress on understanding how regularly these groups can act on uh, compact one manifolds has been incremental. Maybe I'll just summarize sort of the, uh, the, the key features and, and what that tells us about the general behavior of, of right-angled art groups and, and how we might understand uh, <clears throat> sort of um, you know, how these play along with, with regularity. So, so here's one theorem. This is a combination of uh, work of, uh, of a few people. So um, the group F2 cross Z, the free group on 2J generator is cross Z, free product with Z, does not in admit an injective homomorphism into dip two of, of M, where here M is always is equal to the interval or S1. And the corollary of this, you know, that if uh, a right angled Artin group A of gamma injects into diff two plus of M, then in fact, A of gamma injects into diff infinity and uh, <clears throat> A of gamma is isomorphic to a direct product of free products of, of abelian groups. So <clears throat> it's not immediately obvious why this corollary follows from, from this one. Uh, <clears throat> so it, uh, the, the argument uh, combinatorial uh, sort of argument that, that involves something called co-graph hierarchy, which is a characterization of what are called P4 free graph, which are graphs which don't contain an induced path, induced path on four vertices, uh, path of length three. Okay. And so those are, uh, so this is a very, very special class of right angle art groups. It's actually the, the right angle art groups on co-graphs are exactly ones which can be built iteratively by starting with Z and taking finite direct products and finite free products. And then what, um, what this corollary here is saying is that if you build up this hierarchy of, of P4 free graphs, you have to stop at some level above which you get Right angle large groups which do not act by C2 diffeomorphisms and below you do. And the exact level is if you if you do the indices correct, it's like three. So that's um, one thing that one can say. And uh, of course, there's 
So I, I said yesterday that, that right angled arc groups are known always to act by C1 diffeomorphisms on, on S1 or on the interval. And there's a lot between one and two. I mean, there are, you can look at C1 plus epsilon for every epsilon between zero and one. And so what's going on there? Well, um, we were able to improve this at the expense of making this group more complicated. And this is the theorem of, of um, Kim Rivas, which says that um, if you take F2 cross F2 pre product Z. So you have to build up this Z to actually be a, a free group. Uh, this admits no injective map into diff one plus tau of one comma tau um, for any tau greater than zero. So <clears throat> I don't know of a very nice, uh, easy to state characterization of of uh, of writing a lot of groups that that. that cannot act by anything smoother than diff one. Uh, although it's in principle, it's you can sort of look at the defining graph and, and decide if this if this thing is a subgroup or not. So it's it's not so bad. We can decide pretty easily if a given right angle group uh, sits somewhere between uh, sits in terms of regularity exactly at one or somewhere between one and two or above two. And as for this one, I. I simply don't know, and things which do not fall under the purview of this corollary or, or this result. I simply don't know. So that's sort of the um, the summary of, of what's known as far as I know. And let me, maybe in the remaining time, give you some idea of like what <coughs> kinds of ideas go into this. So <clears throat> the crucial fact that gets used is something uh, which appears in a paper of Kim and someone else called the uh, we call the ABT lemma. So uh, what this says is the following. So let let A, B, and T be elements of diff one of the interval, and suppose that uh, the support of A intersect the support of B uh, is empty. And so if you want to have a picture in your mind of what I mean by this, okay, so here's, here's the interval, and here are some, maybe I'll draw them as I did yesterday with these little bumps, and these are A supports, but in general, there are infinitely many of them. Uh, and here are a bunch of B supports. The only rule is that they can't uh, intersect, right? So they can share endpoints because when I so when I say support, I really mean the actual points that are moved by these homeomorphisms. So these are the open supports. These are open intervals. So right. So so A and B are are these arbitrary diffeomorphisms whose supports are disjoint. And then T is anything. And so T could be you know, something that has no fixed points. It could have you know, a bunch of fixed points, it, literally anything. So, and then you consider just the abstract subgroup generated by these three diffeomorphisms. So A and B commute with each other, obviously. And T seems like it usually should not commute with, with, with A and B. And it seems that like if you chose T intelligently, that you would get a free product of Z squared and Z. But this is never true. It, it is never, ever, ever the case that these three diffeomorphisms generate a copy of Z free product Z squared. Now, if you'll recall the, the construction of the faithful action of F2, that I built on the real line yesterday. You can use that same construction to build a continuous action of 
z free product z squared that is faithful on the real line and which has the property that, that the a supports and the b supports are disjoint and so this is not a result about configurations of intervals it's a result about differentiability so the differentiability is, is crucial so maybe in the remaining time i'll uh, i mean I, I don't think i can uh, proving this is a little bit um a little bit hairy so i'm i'll give you an uh, idea of like why why it's useful and how sort of what what is the crucial thing that allows you to establish it so maybe i should write um really else about about rags are uh <coughs> corollaries corollaries with some extra work with the abt lemma okay, so now how can you hope to prove a result like this well the the, the main idea is to find find a, a compactly supported uh, supported uh, diffeomorphism. So what do, what do I mean by this? Okay, I mean the interval is compact. Right? So so what do you mean? A compactly supported diffeomorphism. Um, yeah, that's true. But okay, so here's the interval, and now I have some some group gamma sitting inside of of homeo of I. And let's consider its open support. So the open support is you know, some open subset of the interval. This is the, so this consists precisely of points X such that there exists little gamma in big gamma little gamma of x is not equal to x. So in particular, it ex of, of the interval. And so this is an open subset of the interval, which is not closed. And so, uh, so a compactly supported uh, uh, homeo in in gamma is one uh, who's, uh, uh, so maybe oh, let's name it uh, little gamma, is one whose uh, support of gamma closure is contained inside of the open support of gamma. So in particular, if so the, a compactly supported homeomorphism might be one like, like this, where the endpoints of its of every interval in the support cannot coincide with endpoints of intervals of the full open support. And so in particular, the closure of the support of gamma is a compact subset of this open thing, the support of gamma. So once you have a compactly supported homeomorphism like this, so it's, uh, <clears throat> let me just say, first of all, so, so finding a compactly supported homeomorphism inside of any action by diffeomorphisms like this is not trivial, but it's where the differentiability is used essentially. So maybe I'll write that. So then in, in the ABT, Lemma uh, differentiability is used to find a compactly supported supported diffeomorphism. So, what can you do with a compactly supported diffeomorphism? Well, um, <clears throat> maybe what can be done in general. Uh, uh, it was a purely essential point. I'll give an illustration. Through a, uh, through a result which basically inspired the ABT -T lemma, which is something called the Brin Squire theorem, which shows that um, if you look at the group of piecewise linear 
homeomorphisms of the real line, then this group contains no non-abelian free subgroups. So it's also uh, give that proof now, and uh, I'll, I may have to spill into the next uh, my next lecture to finish it. Bryn Squire theorem. So this was uh, part of the reason that like Thompson's group F was thought of as a as a potential candidate for a uh, a group with no free subgroups that is nevertheless not amenable, although the amenability question remains open to this day after many, many decades and many, many incorrect proofs going both ways. So, so we consider the group PL plus of I. So this consists of, of piecewise linear homeomorphisms of I. So when I say piecewise linear, I always mean you should have finitely many Many non differential points, non differentiable points. So you can, in principle, any particular element of this, you can draw its graph and its piece like that. So the theorem is that PL plus I uh, has, a satis has no. No free non-abelian subgroups and satisfies no law. So what I mean by satisfies no law means that there is no word in the free group, so that when you substitute arbitrary elements for the generators, then you get the, always get the identity. Uh, that's this second part is kind of essential for making for giving content to the first, because I mean if you take Z squared, uh, this has no non-abelian free groups, but it, but it satisfies a law, namely any two elements commute with each other, which is, means that the law is A, B, A inverse, B inverse. So in fact, this works also for, for Thompson's group F, which is a subgroup of, of PLI, PL plus of the interval, where here all the breakpoints are, are dyadic rational and, and slopes are powers of two. So that's a specific uh, case here. And so, right, so in particular, so the, the proof that Brennan Square gave works also for this particular group. Right? So F, which is a, uh, I won't write it down, but it's a, it's a two generated, Two relator subgroup, which I mentioned yesterday, is sort of occurring quite often from this sort of uh, configuration of overlapping intervals. And if you have a homeomorphism moving points sufficiently quickly, points sufficiently quickly, then you get a copy of this. It's isomorphic to F. So it also has no three subgroups and it satisfies no law. So looking at the time, there are no free subgroups. Uh, this afternoon. As for why it satisfies no law, we already did this yesterday. So <clears throat> if you'll recall, I gave a, an action of, of uh, an, uh, a faithful action of the free group on two generators into homeo of R. Remember if I, if I had some word, which was some word in A and B, Right, that I had uh, some configuration of uh, intervals with, with alternating labels, and uh, I just declared the generators to be moving points sort of in fast enough in one direction or the other right, in this alternating way. And so for a particular word, I witnessed that there was some action of this free group where this particular word was not the identity because it moved a point X to W of X, which was way over here. And one thing I mentioned is that I have a lot of what this red and this blue homeomorphism should be. And in particular, because each word here has finite, has finite lengths, so there are only really finite and many alternations between red and blue like this. I can choose red and blue to be 
piecewise linear if I want to. And so if I your favorite element of the free group, I can find two piecewise linear homeomorphisms, in fact, two elements of Thompson's group, if you wish, which do not satisfy that word as a law. And so that, so I basically already proved that part of the Brin Squire theorem yesterday. And that was intentional. And so then I'll stop here and this afternoon I'll 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 prove that uh, this group has no free non-abelian subgroups. A bit bigger pardon? Uh, I, I don't know enough about its course geometry to know. Sorry. Okay, well, there's no other question. We'll uh, take a break for lunch and we'll see again at 1.30 by the time. Let's get to the